Okay, then I think we'll get started. Um, good evening, everyone. This is the Northampton Board of Health. It's October 20th. Um, we will start with public comment session before we formally open the um, board meeting. Um, <clears throat> we do want to hear from everyone, um, but in the interest of time, we ask you to limit your comments to two minutes. Um, Cynthia or Janet, anybody willing to uh, be our timer tonight? Happy to. Okay, um, thank you. Can you thank just you. remind me, Joanne, are we two, or two or three minutes? Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Two minutes. Um, <clears throat> if you would like, um, so um, community members, um, I cannot see you, um, but I will be able to see your electronic hands. If you would like to um, give public comment, please go to the reactions button down at the bottom and raise your hand or do something over there and I'll be able to, uh, to see, see you to call on you. Any public comment? I see Emily. Emily, you may unmute. Great. Um, I just wanted to make a brief comment about the masking situation at the uh, Northampton Senior Center. People, of course, have varying views on the efficacy of masking, but I think the science is pretty clear that COVID is um, is most dangerous or more dangerous for people over 65, uh, which of course are those people who are most likely to use the senior center. So I just wanted to mention that I think that people in the center and people being transported to and from the center um, should be should have masking required. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Melissa, you may unmute. So um, I wanted to speak about a similar issue. Um, I support what Emily just said. Um, I um, would like to suggest that if for some reason um, the Board of Health does not want to recommend that people wear masks um, when they are in the senior center, that they at least consider um, asking the senior center to have a um, questionnaire um, um, distributed to members of the senior center, asking them whether they would um, prefer to have a mask requirement, or have no mask requirement, or have a mask advisory. since. It seems like everybody's assuming that more people who go to the senior center would prefer not to have a mask um, requirement, but I don't know that that's true, and I think it's incumbent upon us to at least find that out. Um, I would also suggest that if we are going to do something about um, having people driving seniors um, use masks if the senior requests it, that's something that should be negotiated before the person gets into a vehicle with a driver. So I, I, I know at Northampton Neighbors, I don't actually know the protocol for senior center driving, but I know with Northampton Neighbors, there's always a conversation between the driver and the person they're driving ahead of time. And I think that would be the time to resolve that issue. It's very awkward to um, ask somebody to put a mask on that you don't know um, when you're dependent on them to bring you someplace. And lastly, I'd like to bring up the issue, although this is the wrong time of year, of requiring masks in the cooling center. Um, the cooling center is a site which has a <coughs> much larger proportion of vulnerable people to COVID and other diseases than most other indoor locations in the city. And um, I think the responsible thing to do to protect those people is to require that everybody wear masks when inside the scene, a cooling center. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, is there anyone else who would like to give public comment? Uh, who else do I see? Eleanor. You may unmute. Uh, yes, hello. I also want to speak to masks at the senior center. I really appreciate that masks are not required. Um, I go to several exercise classes a week and I find that masks make it hard to breathe and I might well choose not to go if I had to wear a mask. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to comment? Gary or Candice? Do you yes, want to thank comment? You, thank thank you so much. Go I ahead. was having trouble with my other computer, so I had to switch. Um, my, and I appreciate um, Melissa's comments, and I understand also that there are people, you know, in the senior center who um, would prefer not to mask. What really I'm like at requesting of the senior center, I've talked with them and, and also to the Board of Health, is that at least as a fair minimum, there should be signage saying that it is suggested that seniors wear masks in the senior center for their safety and the safety of others. There is not a single mask, a single sign on any of the doors, you know, as of yesterday that I was there. Um, and I, I do understand that a lot of seniors will not wear masks, but I think it is the minimal, minimal thing that could be done is to suggest and to educate, you know, that masks, you know, are suggested or highly recommended for seniors when they're indoors for a long period of time. Um, and, and also on Melissa's second point relative to transportation provided by senior services. Um, and, and sometimes I believe they are provided uh, through a, a taxi service um, that those drivers, especially as we're going into the winter season and especially, you know, where windows are going to be closed in a small space that they also wear a mask if requested by the passenger. Uh, I, I think it's not healthy, you know, um, for somebody who is going to a doctor's appointment, who is a senior and who's depending on um, the public transportation or, or a, the senior services public transportation, um, that they be protected um, if they request it, you know, and not be exposed to somebody driving in a small taxi um, to germs. Um, and those are my two requests. That's time. Considered. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone else like to make public comment? I don't see other any other hands up. Thank you. I really do appreciate your comments. We all do. We listen very carefully. Um, I just want to remind you that the protocol for the Board of Health is that we, we can't respond to your comments at this time, um, but we do appreciate your comments. Um, anybody else? Going once, going twice? Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I think we'll move on with um, our meeting. Uh, would uh, one of the members of the board like to um, make a motion to open the board meeting? Move to open the meeting and close public comment and open the meeting. Do I hear a second? I'll second it. Thank you. All in favor? Cynthia? Do we have a call or no? We do a roll call for votes because not everybody can see everyone, sure. Yep. Uh, Janet? Yes. Yes, Joanne, yes, okay. Uh, our Board of Health meeting is now open. Uh, it's October 20th, 2022. It's um, 5.44 p.m. And this is an, um, a Zoom meeting and it is being recorded. Um, so, 
Um, tonight, uh, we have uh, myself as the chair, Cynthia Swopis, and our new member, Janet Grant. Uh, uh, not present tonight are um, Suzanne Smith and Dallas Dukar. Um, um, Janet, do you want to, Janet is our newest member. Do you want to introduce yourself briefly? Sure. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I really feel it's an honor and a privilege to be able to join the Board of Health. Um, very briefly, I've lived in Northampton for about 12 years. I have lived in Western Mass my whole life, and I've worked in the field of public health for my entire career. Um, I have an undergraduate degree in sociology and a master's of science in public health and spent a number of years working for what was first called the Western Mass Prevention Center, later called the Western Mass Center for Healthy Communities. It was um, um, monies that came through from SAMHSA to the Department of Public Health and uh, was allocated to various agencies across the state, including Cooley Dickinson Hospital, which um, held the grant for many, many years here in Western Mass. Um, so I worked for them for a very long time. Um, and then the last seven years of my career, I worked at Holyoke Community College, helping to develop their academic certificate for community health workers. Um, I believe that I'm very passionate about what community health workers can bring to, um, to the field and to uh, the solutions um, with all the public health issues that we're, that we're dealing with all the time. So um, I recently retired. I wanted to continue working in some way in the field, uh, but have a lot, a lot of time that I get with retirement. So um, have chosen to do it this way and I appreciate the opportunity to do this. Well, we're so glad to have you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, great. Um, next on our agenda is a hearing uh, regarding Jim's Variety Store. Um, who is here uh, for that hearing? Can you raise your hands, please, your electronic hands? Hamid? Okay. Uh, is there anyone else here with you? Okay. Um, okay, we're going to start. Um, let me find my papers. One second. Good evening. This is uh, Hamid. Great. Uh, let me just find my papers one second. Um, okay. Hi there, Hamid. Uh, this is Meredith. I've allowed you um, to unmute, and if you want to put your video on, you can also do that. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, okay. Is there great. anyone else here accompanying you? Uh, no, it, it is just me. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so uh, to start this um, this hearing, uh, first we need a motion. Would a board member like to make a motion to open the public hearing? I'll move to open the public hearing on the um, um, Jim's Variety Store issue. Is there a second? I'll second it. Janet, thank you. Um, all in favor, Cynthia? Yes. Janet? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Um, great, thank you. Um, so just a word about how this will go. Um, <clears throat> I'd like everyone to pay attention to the ground rules for this hearing. Uh, in order to speak, you must be recognized by me to speak. Um, uh, Hamid, um, anyone else you want to bring in, you can provide oral testimony, documents, photographs, videos, models, any other way you want to give any information. We are going to listen mainly to uh, issues that are uh, evidence that is relevant to this particular issue. Um, irrelevant immaterial information based on speculation and emotion are not appropriate for this um, to be submitted as evidence. 
Um, and the rules of evidence that apply in court are not the same as in this public hearing. Um, so hearsay and other evidence that would not be permitted in a court may be heard by the board. Um, and we will weigh those as appropriate. Um, so the notice of the hearing, Meredith, is that the uh, cease and desist order? It is, yeah. Okay. I'm going to read the notice. Uh, so this correction, deceased and desist order was issued to Jim's Variety at 15 West Farms Road, Florence, Massachusetts, 01062, and it is dated 10-4-22. Please be advised that on 10-3-22 at 3.30 p.m., a compliance inspection was conducted on behalf of the Northampton Tobacco Control Program. Jim's Variety violated the state law entitled An Act to Modernize Tobacco Control. That is CMR, it's 105 CMR 665.000 uh, by the following. Offering for sale a flavored tobacco product or tobacco product flavor enhancer. Number two, failure of a non-age restricted retail establishment to maintain a record of the documentation submitted by the manufacturer or manufacturer's agent, certifying that an unflavored nicotine delivery product has a nicotine content of 35 milligrams per milliliter or less. Number three, failure to maintain a record of the documentation submitted by the manufacturer or manufacturer's agent, certifying that such tobacco product does not meet the definition of a flavored tobacco product or tobacco product flavor enhancer, and that the product lacks any characterizing flavor. Number four, um, Additional violations below, and additional violations are stated that the state permit uh, was not posted for sale of cigars. There was no written plan for disposal of liquid nicotine containers, which is CMR, uh, sorry, 310 CMR 30, local reg 12, and selling single cigars below minimum price requirements, local regs 11, sorry, 1 and 12, 11 and 12. You are hereby ordered to cease and desist from violating this act, an act to modernize tobacco control, 105 CMR 665.000. In addition, the following fines and actions apply um, against Jim's Variety for violation of 105 CMR 665.000. Um, first violation, a fine of $1,000. Additionally, tobacco product sales permit shall be suspended for seven business day days pursuant to 105 CMR 040. I think that is a typo because I think it's 045. Uh, to begin October 24th, 2022. You are hereby ordered to pay the amount of $1,000 by check or money order paid to the city of Northampton within 21 days of receipt of this order to the following address, Department of Health and Human Services, 212 Main Street, Northampton. If you wish to contest any part of this order, you have the right to request a hearing before the board. This request must be made by you in writing and filed within seven days after the date this order was served and, or actually received. Any affected party has a right to appear at said hearing. Failure to comply with this order may result in additional penalties as permitted by law. This is signed by Donna Bowman? Bowman, yeah. Bowman on 10-4-22. Um, and we did in fact receive a letter uh, from Jim's Variety asking for this hearing. Um, okay. Um, first, I'd like to ask um, Donna if she's here. Yep, I'm here. You... Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, are you on the phone? Okay. No, no, I'm, oh, I'm there. on the I, I see you. Thank you for joining. Um, so uh, could you please let us know your findings? Yes, first, can you state uh, I, your position, I'm, Donna? I'm sorry, for I'm the sorry. people on the phone, can you first state your position with the DHA? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, um, I'm Donna Bowman. I am uh, the health inspector here in the city of Northampton, and I'm also a uh, tobacco control officer with Pioneer, to Valley, uh, Pioneer Valley Tobacco Coalition. Um, Thank you. Uh, the reason for, uh, for this, uh, the reason we ended up getting this, we had a complaint that came in to the health department uh, in, in the city of Northampton. Uh, from a concerned parent, uh, wanted to remain anonymous, uh, that uh, their son, their child is being sold tobacco and alcohol at Jim's Variety. 
um, asked if we would uh, conduct an inspection uh, and gave us some information on uh, what, what was being sold. Uh, at that point, uh, same day on 10-3, we, we arrived at Jim's Variety, uh, myself and Inspector Jasmine Ward. Uh, we did do a, an inspection on site uh, and were able to find exactly where the, uh, the uh, tobacco products were that, that were of concern. Um, they were uh, hidden uh, in a garbage can behind the counter underneath a bag of trash. Uh, and um, it went from there. Um, the inspection was a full inspection for tobacco, so that's why we found other uh, violations, um, as noted in the letter. Uh, that's where we are with it. Donna, could you explain, I'm sorry, um, what tobacco products that you found that were prohibited by the Absolutely. law? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we found uh, multiple uh, uh, cans of mint, wintergreen, and spearmint chewing tobacco. Uh, we also found flavored uh, cigars, uh, and, uh, it, it all mixed in the same bag. They were all in a, in a, in a bag that was on the bottom. So most of it was mint, uh, mint, menthol, and wintergreen uh, products. And I'll just state for the record that you submitted an, a number of photos of these yes, products. Yes. Does anybody have uh, any questions? Any board members, uh, Meredith, have any questions uh, for Donna? Cynthia? Um, yeah, Donna, thank you. Um, just to clarify, um, the, the store in question does have a tobacco license. Yes, ma'am. And so um, the um, the items that were hidden are, can be legally sold to adults? They cannot. In Massachusetts, uh, mint, mint uh, any flavored item is prohibited from being sold. And so it, it isn't just a restriction of children here. It is a prohibit. It, it's prohibited in the state to sell in flavored the state products. And in the city regulations. Thank you. OK, just wanted to um, clarify that. And also, um, just outside our purview, um, the complaint that came in that was anonymous mentioned alcohol. Do we have a process where we turn that complaint over to another department to investigate that? Uh, we don't have a, a formal process for that. That would go to the ABCC and they conduct, they conduct compliance checks. So I just, just to clarify, would we do that? Would we send our complaint to them to see if that infraction is happening as well? Because it wasn't witnessed by us, it's not part of our normal protocol, but we could most certainly inform them that we received a complaint thereof. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. just curious. No, that's a Thank good you. idea. Mm -hmm. that Thank you. Great. That would be great to do that. Um, okay, any other questions from board members? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Just one more question. We did not witness the sale. I just want to clarify that. We did not. Of any products. Okay. Thank you. Um, that's a very good question. Um, okay. Um, May I add something, okay. Joanne? Sure, go ahead. We don't have to witness the sale of menthol flavored products. We do have to witness the sale of an underage buying, but when it comes to menthol pro products, they're not allowed to have them mm -hmm. on site. Thank you. Thank you for that mm -hmm. clarification. Okay. Um, Hamid, would you like to speak? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I am, I'm also actually trying to turn on my camera, but it's um, not allowing me to do that. But if it's not required, I'm, I'm fine with it. I'll try one more time. If it's not, it's fine. I mean, it's as, as long as you are okay with that, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead, try one more time. Great. There you go. Great. Right. Welcome. Yeah. 
Go for sorry, it. Sorry, I'm growing beard these days, so <laughs> I'm sorry. So um, I wanted to uh, appear in this meeting. We had this compliance done on October 3rd. Uh, there were a few violations were found. Um, first of all, I want to clear this thing that I'm not contesting any charges. Um, we, we take full responsibility of, uh, uh, for all these violations. Um, I just wanted to have a chance to um, explain a little. Um, so I'll start with uh, you know the second, third, and fourth violation, which is mainly of the documents. Um, I approached uh, the Board of Health after receiving this um, citation. Uh, there were a few things that we had no idea that we needed, like the manufacturer documents. Um, so I have approached the manufacturers of those material and they will be sending us those documents to keep in a file inside the store. Um, so that has been taken care of. Um, one violation was not having the cigar permit posted. Uh, we did have the state issued cigar. It wasn't just um, posted at the time of the inspection, which we also have um, uh, posted now. I'm making a file that I'll, I'll also drop it at the uh, Board of Health um, uh, within the next couple of days. Uh, so most of these uh, violations were document related and um, we, we have created a file uh, to keep it in the store at all times. And um, I will also drop a copy to the Board of Health. Um, the most, um, um, I would say the biggest violation or most concerned violation came in the form of having a, a flavored tobacco. Um, I would love to give an explanation why those were there, um, but I completely understand that at this point, you know, whatever we say would be, would be an excuse, to be honest with you, if the material if the tobacco was there, we take the full responsibility of that and uh, um, we, we accept the consequences. Um, so based, based on that, um, since it is already first violation, um, I see that we are required to pay a fine of $1,000 and or uh, a seven day suspension. Uh, now, before I go in, into that, this is the first time during this meeting I came to know that there was a complaint of uh, selling an alcohol to underage. Um, we never had that complaint. This is the first time I'm hearing it here. Uh, I'm going to go over with my employees. If somebody did it, I will ask them. But um, I'm managing this store since last 12 years now, and uh, we never had any complaints or any violation as far as uh, alcohol is concerned. Uh, we are very strict. We have all the signs. Uh, we have a training for employees to make sure that we are not selling it to um, underage. I also had a very big and uh, tough meeting with the employee who, um, uh, who was complained about. I heard this complaint as well through an email from directly the um, uh, the complainer. Um, so I um, I spoke to them about it as well, and we'll make sure that uh, nothing like this ever happens in that store. It's a community store. Um, we we understand uh, our our responsibility, our role in that community, and um, it's a from, promise from our side that we'll make sure uh, none of these violations will ever be appeared or happen in in that store. Uh, under my management. Um, so coming back to the um, um, the penalty for the first violation as per uh, rules is the $1,000 fine and up to seven days of uh, suspension. I would uh, request um, with a promise that, you know, these violations will never happen again. We'll make sure our documents are up to date and employees are properly trained. Um, fine is $1,000, which is already very high. We'll pay that. We are guilty of all these violations. Uh, I would like to request if we can get a little relief on as far as suspension is concerned. Um, it's, it's a small uh, community store. Um, there's literally nothing around in that part of the town. 
I'm talking about of, of the uh, the Route 66 uh, near the um, uh, West Farm Road on up, up near the um, uh, West Hampton border. Um, it's 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 a mere request that if if we just pay fine and uh, given a relief as far as suspension is concerned, uh, with a promise that it will never happen again. Thank you. Um, board members, uh, Meredith, anybody uh, have questions for Hamid? Meredith? I do. Um, Hamid, I, your history with tobacco is not good. Um, I'm looking back at the previous inspection report from this year and you were cited for having flavored product then. And I know Inspector Bowman told you at that time that it was prohibited. We were given leniency to our merchants because this act um, 105 CMR 665 was effective during the heat of COVID June 2020. And so we weren't out in our establishments like we should have been because our work was prioritized with COVID. So we felt at that time when we started doing tobacco inspections that those who did have flavored products at that time, we would give them some relief and we would just do a written warning because perhaps maybe not everybody was informed as well as they should have been um, about the new law, state law that was put into effect. So in fact, on that inspection report, it was cited then that you had flavored product amongst a few other violations. And in addition to Hamid, you also have previous violations of selling to minors. And we have that all on record. Um, and what we have done, we could have incorporated this violation with the previous violations that you've had to actually make it a third offense of the regulation for which we didn't. We just um, cited it under the new state law, making it your first offense. So I feel like, you know, you've had plenty of chances to be a good community partner and um, your record just shows something different. Uh, I, I agree with you on that, Margaret, and I take the responsibility for that. Uh, the, the incident you're mentioning here right now, I, I remember that because I had, you know, discussed at the uh, at that time with the with the inspector at that time. Uh, it was um, um, a pack of cigar that we were not aware that it comes in either flavor or not uh, in, in a in a convenience store environment. That uh, there are thousands of products. Um, there are products that would come as green or as orange, um, we, we don't know if those considered as flavors are not right now after it's, it's been, I think, two years now since, you know, the flavors are not allowed anymore. At this point, we have a pretty much good idea about, you know, what products are considered flavor and what are not. Um, so, as I said, going forward, I'll make sure that we have a better training. Um, um, the store is run on 100% on employees. I, even though I'm the manager, I'm personally not there, but I agree it's 100% my responsibility to mm -hmm. make sure everything is, you know, up to date. Mm -hmm. um, I do want to add, you know, in addition to training, you can use um, us as a resource. If you have any question about what might be a flavor and what not, um, you can contact our inspectors at any time or, or if you need new signs. So please utilize us as a resource moving forward. I will. I will. That's why I approached Board of Health. I spoke to uh, Donna uh, about last week that I did not understand uh, what kind of documents we need from manufacturers to have it displayed in our store. And she um, sat down with me. She explained me everything in detail. So we requested those from that. If anything like that, I'll keep an eye. I will make sure that I approach you if I have any questions. Certainly. Thank you. I have to say, I'm also concerned about the uh, sale of flavored tobacco products that uh, did not appear to be a mistake. The fact that they were hidden in a trash can um, under the trash 
uh, does make it appear that it was a willful, uh, willful act, was not an error. Um, I, I completely agree with you. That makes us completely guilty for that. I, I knew that those items were not um, allowed to be sold. Um, I explained uh, to Board of Health before that. Uh, if, if I, I want to give an explanation if you'll owe me a chance on, on that. I don't want to sound it as an excuse, but um, recently, a couple of weeks back, we did a complete uh, a cleanup of the store. We found a lot of uh, uh, flavor products. Um, between us, we didn't want to throw those and it was already too late to return those to manufacture because we had a a given date of a um, couple of years back. Uh, most of these items were already expired except for maybe one or two, which were going to be expired within the next two, three months. So we, I kept it there, even my, uh, I don't know if uh, Donna can um, explain this, that even, even employees didn't know that it, it was there. It was I who put it there, uh, only very few customers who knew that it was there. Uh, just to be distributing uh, without any charge. Now we have 40, 50,000 items in, in, in that store and uh, sale of just a couple of flavored tobacco at a risk of you know, losing us the license. It's, it's, it's never a benefit for us. Uh, that's why we, we, we have never done that, that kind of sales before. Um, and we'll, I'll make sure that it never happens again. And may I ask what's happened to those products since um, Inspector uh, Bowman's visit? Uh, those were removed the same day um, and those were uh, uh, destroyed, thrown away in the garbage. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Hamid? Hey, thank you. Uh, do you have any other testimony you'd like to bring? Anybody else to speak? Any other, anything else you would like to uh, to bring? Uh, not at this point. Only a request that you know, if if we can get a, a, a little relief on the suspension, uh, we'll pay fine. If you want us to pay more fine, we'll we'll do that. Um, I see here. Um, it's up to seven days, which does um, affect business in overall, but that's not important at this point. I understand that, you know, we had the violation. We, uh, we are guilty of that and it, it's just a mere request. Okay, thank you. Um, any last questions for Hamid? Okay, um, so I think at this point um, we'll close the public portion of this hearing. Um, would anyone like to make a motion to close the public portion of this hearing? Motion to close the public portion of the hearing. Thank you. Second? I'll second it. Thank you. All in favor? Janet? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Um, Thank you for coming and uh, explaining the situation. Thank you, uh, Donna, for coming as well. Um, so now we've closed the public portion of that hearing. Um, and um, so now the board has the opportunity to deliberate, uh, discuss the evidence and the elements of the violation. Um, if we feel that we don't have all the information that we need, we can continue this to a later date. Um, if you feel like you have all the information you need, it could come to a vote. Um, but at this point, no new evidence um, can be brought in. Um, but we can ask for questions um, and we can have some clarifications if we need to. Um, um, I'd like to start by asking Meredith about the state regs versus the local regs and how that all works. Sure. Um, so the state regs, like I mentioned before, came into effect um, January 2020. 
And in the state regs, there is clarification on, let me just bring something up for you here. Um, excuse me one second while I just look this up. I don't wanna get it wrong. So there are some policies that are subject to the state law and fines, and they are, you know, tobacco sales to the person, uh, to people under the age of 21, flavor tobacco product sales. Um, and there's a whole list of them that fall under this um, section of the law, 105 CMR 665, and then there's Mass General Law, Chapter 270, Section 6. And if you're in violation of these, then you're subject to the minimum of the state fines. Because our local regulations are less strict than what the state regulations are now in regards to penalties, we have chosen just to go with the state. Our local regulation says for first, for first violation, it's $100, second, it's $200, and a suspension period of, I think, seven days. And then third violation is $500 or... $300 I don't have in front of me, suspension of 30 days and fourth violation is um, revocation of the sales permit. Um, because the state fines are heftier, we have to go with the state penalties versus the local regulations. At some point, I hope we can merge the two and adopt the state into ours, but for now it is what it is. And so as far as the fine, we need to go with the state. And I did look at those regs and it says uh, shall uh, as, as opposed to may, meaning if, if we agree that and, and Hamid has agreed that those violations occurred, the uh, fee shall be assessed. Um, and Meredith, a second question about the um, ban on selling for a certain amount of time. I do not believe that's in the state regs, but that is in our regs as the second violation. Um, let me just look. The state first violation is a fine of a thousand. Second violation within 36 months is 2000 and prohibition of sale for either one to up between one and seven days. Um, so we're sort of in the middle here that um, there was a violation um, back in August, uh, but there was no cease and desist order at that time. That was just a, a written warning and education. Um, so um, if we're going with the state regs, um, uh, Amerith, did you say there was a recommendation to start um, start fresh with the new regulations in 2020? Do you want to talk yes. about that? Yes. So the Mass Tobacco Control Program and Cheryl Sabara from MAHB um, recommended to boards of health that we kind of use this as a reset button with the new law coming in effect in 2020. So not to disregard completely any violations prior to that. But when it comes to these, what they're calling egregious offenses, sales to minors, uh, sale of, of flavored products, that we start our new, bio, um, our, our new, um, I guess, violations with the clock ticking of, Jan, uh, J, excuse me, Jan, June 2020. So anything prior, you don't want to account for because they didn't, that state was, um, regulation was not enacted yet. So if we had merged our regulations with the state regulations, I feel like we very well could have just continued counting violate one violation after the other, but because we didn't do that, um, the recommendation is to just have a clean slate for all of our establishments and starting June 2020, that's when the clock starts for any violations subsequent to that date. So that's the recommendation. And that's, you know, being part of the tobacco control program, that's what I want to say all of the communities, 27 of our communities are doing. 
So, Meredith, does that mean we're technically at the second violation? No. Uh, so, technically, we would be at the third violation. Okay, okay. Under our local regulation. But the first violation since the new enactment of 105665, the state regulation. So our third violation of the local regulation was only a fine of $300, but the first violation of um, the state regulation was $1,000, whereas the third violation of the state is $5,000. But because they weren't in violation of the state law for the third time, we couldn't use the $5,000 but yet the thousand was a heftier penalty than our local regulation. So it was kind of difficult choosing which way to go because they're not concise. Um, so we went with the state regulation, albeit being the first violation. Does that make sense? Well, it, it makes sense, but I'm trying to figure out where the seven day um suspension falls so right and that yes. logic <laughs> yeah no that. absolutely yeah um it is my understanding that um the in the regulation it said the first violation was one to 30 days and when we looked to find it just before the meeting we weren't able to successfully find where it was written but um it's clear that the second one was seven days. So I don't know, you as a board can actually suspend it, you know, because we do have that in our local regulation, but we couldn't find it at the last minute in the state regulation. You, so it's in the cease and desist letter that the state supplied us, that it's a fine of $1,000 and a suspension of one to 30 days for the first violation. And we came up with the seven, how? Um, it kind of an arbitrary number. I think, okay. I, you know, we looked at history sure. and we felt that, you know, in the past, their permit has been suspended for seven days. So going anything less than seven days is, you know, wouldn't be impactful since they've already had that penalty once before and we're still in the same situation. And um, going forward, forward beyond, beyond Jim's variety, we are still going to be balancing these two things or have we reset now? <laughs> oh, right, no, um, we, it was intended at our, our last scheduled Board of Health meeting where we were going to discuss this and kind of set the fine, uh, excuse me, not the fine, because the fine is set, but the penalty for the number of days for this suspension. Um, so it was equitable across the board, but we didn't have that meeting and an opportunity before this transpired. So okay. something that we do have to figure out in the future. So there is no ambiguity and everything is uniform. And, and technically, I'm sorry to ask so many questions. I just want to see where our, our <laughs> room for um, um, the, the suspension is. It, we, technically, we could have said 30 days based on the logic that you just provided us, the history in Correct. this particular case. Correct. Mm -hmm. And we decided to go with seven. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, and thank you for that history because I... I um, yeah, COVID messed everything up, so mm -hmm. good. All right. So my question is, um, I know when we wrote these regulations, we wrote that um, violation of this regulation will result in the following penalties and we took out the may or can because we wanted it to be really clear and fair for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess I'm confused about how many violations there are and because I'd like to just be clear about that and then go by the rules for that 
number of violations. I mean, if it's the third violation for our rules, but the first violation by the state, that seems messy. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not that it couldn't be. Um, and then if we do say, if we want to go that route and say it's the first violation by the new state regs, that's only a thousand dollar fine. If we want to say it's a third violation for our local regs, then it says a fine and 30 days uh, sales permit shall be suspended for 30 days. Um, so I think to for clarity and for fairness, I think we should de decide what number of violations it is under which regs and go with the penalties that are written for those number of penalties. Does that make some sense? And you can, there are penalties both for local and for state, but the, the um, fines are stricter for the state, so we have to go with that one. Is that correct? Yes. I, I, I do think, yeah, we should clarify that, but maybe perhaps in a future meeting where we can have a discussion and had Cheryl Sabara in attendance to make sure that we're merging them properly. I'm not, mm -hmm. and if, um, you know, just to kind of add on to this, um, we could have, we could have actually had the store with this one inspection report be in their third violation, just based off the number of violations that we are, but we just put it under one umbrella as first violation, each of the violations could have been a separate violation. Each of the violations articulated in the, the letter. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, could have been distinct. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Because yeah. there, there's about four of them, isn't there? Or five mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's not clear in our regulations that it's how many violations that happen concurrently. Um, the way it reads first violation, second violation sounds like it's over time. So that's not clear to me. Yeah, I, and I, I actually, the second and fourth, I think, as Hamid spoke to that manufacturer's documentation that there's, I, I, I quite frankly missed that when we were doing the regs that there's 35% nicotine or something like that. Um, so that's a, a requirement that the store owner has got to write to the manufacturer and the manufacturer has got to write back. Is that basically what what's being required here? Yeah, the manufacturer has to request them. Um, it's a unique, it's a unique law to Massachusetts. I'm not okay. sure how many other states require that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not um, saying I would be against it. I was just trying to understand it. Was mm -hmm. as Hamid was saying that he um, he hadn't done that that step mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. get that that certification. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to understand that. Okay. Yeah, it's. <laughs> I don't know. Um, um, uh, clearly, there has been a history. Clearly, there has been a record. Clearly, we have a lot of policies that address what's occurred and violations have occurred. I think the $1,000 fine is fair. I don't know about the seven days. I, you know, I think it's, um, uh, boy, having been suspended once, I think the retailer understands the implications of that suspension and um, and thus, you know, that's the reason uh, I'll pay the thousand, but I'd like a reprieve or, or lesser days on the on the seven day suspension. At the same time, the, the, the record is there. You know, this is something that has happened so many times. So um, I'm just um, listening to the discussion and wondering the best direction to go in and Janet, I'll say at your first meeting, if you're totally confused, <laughs> so am I. You're not alone. <laughs> this is a little, this is a naughty one. Um, so I don't know. Um, you're on you're mute. Muted. You're yeah. muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, I am following along with everything that's that's taken place. There, 
under the additional violations, I didn't hear any mention of the selling single cigars below minimum price requirement, which is not a document kind of thing. That's another thing that's directly impacting consumers. Um, and it is, it, it is a separate violation here. Um, so, so there's that. Um, I agree. I, I think it, it seems like it's pretty clear based on the state regs that the minimum does need to be the thousand dollars. And I guess the only part I'm still unclear of is do the state regs, or maybe the way I should ask it is, it sounds like from what you've said that state regs give some flexibility with how many days, anywhere from one to 30 with the first violation. Is that correct, Meredith? Or first violation that I see in the regs does not say anything about suspension of sales, but Meredith found different information. So that's part of the confusion here. So, I mean, maybe we do need to hold off until we can find that in the state regs. Um, because to be consistent, if we're going to go with that, it, we're considering it a first offense since June 2020 for all the reasons that Meredith outlined before. Um, and we want to be consistent about that with anybody who violates. And we're going with state regs because we have to, it sounds like, and they're the stronger we're deferring to the stronger regulation or the one that has, you know, kind of more in terms of the, the amount owed, the fee, as well as the possibility of how much time to suspend a license for. We should be clear what does it say and go with what the state says, not what the local regs say. Meredith, is there um, someone to whom we can request some advice, Cheryl Sabara perhaps, or other folks at the state level? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, we, I could get something in writing from Cheryl almost immediately, or she can attend our next Board of Health hearing. I think what we should do or what I recommend at this point is first, the board vote on whether we're upholding, whether or not this is a violation and vote on that. And then we can set the penalty at the future date if that, if we wanna do that once we have more clarification. Um, and I think we owe it to the community and the merchants to be um, uniform in what the penalties are. So I think maybe um, amending our regulations. So we have, in fact, that in place. So moving forward, it's equitable, would be a good thing to do. Is, is your recommendation, Meredith, to include um, holding off on the $1,000 fine as well, thinking that they might be wrapped up into this package? I, I think that's clear um, yep. that with the state law that that's the penalty. Um, it's, I think it's just the matter of determining how many days for the first violation. So tonight we could move to say, this is not a motion, but we could move to say that um, there was a violation and a thousand dollar fine, monetary fine will hold. And um, we are reviewing, um, we need more information to determine um, action on the suspension. That sounds very reasonable to me. Maybe we should separate those three items into three votes. Or the so. first two can go together. Mm -hmm. So one would be a motion um, to uphold the violation. The second would be a motion to impose the thousand dollar fine because there is latitude, it does say may instead of shall. And then the third is to um, to uh, 
after deliberation of um, amending our local regulations to incorporate the state law and we'll set a finite a number of days for a permit suspension for the first violation, then we will move forward with imposing the suspension. Or just getting advice from the state oh, on okay. on how to um, on how to manage the two different sets of regulations. Okay. Would anyone like to make a motion? Cynthia, uh, I'm writing. Um, <clears throat> um, mm -hmm. So I move to uphold the violation at the Jim's Variety Store uh, as specified in the documentation um, to impose a thousand dollar fine for those violations. And then finally to obtain um, advice, to obtain guidance on how to respond to a suspension based on the local and state regulations. That's just a shot, Kelly. I don't know if you have that or not. <laughs> but. So I, I, I was under the impression that we needed to have three separate motions. The first one being that we're upholding the violation, the second one on the fine, and the third one on um, what we're going to do about the susp license suspension. That yeah. would be my recommendation, um, just so it's super clear. Okay. So, so I'll make a motion that well, we, we have a, a Cynthia made a motion. Sorry, do you want to with, withdraw your motion? Yeah, I'll take that motion off the table. <laughs> Janet. So I'll make a motion that we um, uphold the cease and desist order um, due to the violation of Jim's variety store of the things that are written in the cease and desist order, the violations that are listed. And so in the cease and desist order, it does talk about the thousand dollars and the seven business days. So you're just we, referring to the oh, violations. Just <laughs> referring to the violations, yes. Okay, do you wanna restate that? <laughs> so. So I make a motion that we uphold the violation portion of the cease and desist order regarding Jim's Variety Store, um, the compliance check that took place on 10-4-2022. Any discussion of that? Do I hear a second? Oh, second. Thank you. Any other, any discussion? Any questions, comments? All right, we'll put that to a vote. Um, Janet? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you. Uh, do I hear another motion? Um, I'll move to impose a $1,000 fine on Jim's Variety Store for the in tobacco for the infractions against the tobacco regulations, violations of tobacco regulations. Is there a second? I second it. Thank you. Any discussion, comments? All in favor, Cynthia? Uh, yes. Janet? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anyone want to make another motion? I'll make a motion that we um, that we delay um, the considering the license the amount of days for a license suspension until we've had a chance to receive guidance from the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards um, and deliberate after that. Meredith, does that sound right? 
Mm -hmm. That's a, that was excellent. <laughs> Cynthia, uh, um, I mean, um, I need a second. I'll second the motion. Any other comments or questions? Um, Meredith, would this mean that this hearing is continued or I think that's what that means because we haven't finished our business. This would be continued to another date. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so all in favor, Janet? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you, Hamid, for coming and, and discussing with us. Thank you, Donna, for coming. Um, now we need a motion to close or um, we're not going to, we're going to continue. If you want, we need a motion to continue this hearing to the next scheduled board meeting. Does that sound right, Meredith? Or we're going to have, um, we're not mm -hmm. going to have a special meeting for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. A motion to continue the Jim's Variety Store hearing to a future Board of Health meeting. Is there a second? Second. Any other discussion or comments? All in favor, Cynthia? Yes. Janet? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you all. Thank you, Hamid. Okay. Um, Thank you. Hamid, I will follow up in writing just so it's very clear the motions that were made tonight. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. On to new business and department updates. Uh, Janet has introduced herself, but are there um, um, staff from the Department of Health, sorry, Department of Health and Human Services, that would like to introduce themselves tonight? I don't know who we, who we have. We have Kelly. Not sure who else is here. Um, we have... Kelly, Elliot, Sean, and I believe that's it. And Donna, who you've already met and is gone now. Okay. Um, so, um, so, Janet, I haven't formally met you. I'm <laughs> Meredith O'Leary. I'm the health commissioner for the Department of Health and Human Services. Glad to have you aboard. Thank you. I'm very happy, as I said, <laughs> to be aboard, and it's very nice to meet you even this way. <laughs> Other staff members, uh, can you unmute them, uh, Meredith? They are uh, all set. If you could just show your face and wave and say who you are and what you do. <laughs> hey, Joanne and everyone on the board. Um, I know some of you, but not all. My name is Sean Donovan. I am the implementation director for our division <laughs> of whoop, community care. Um, yeah, and I don't know if how much it uh, makes sense for me to share about that project, but uh, I guess I will I'll just name briefly, like we're developing um, an alternative first responder team for our city and among other things. So um, yeah, but I'll, I, I'm open to more questions, but I'll leave it at that. You're on the know. agenda for a, a brief introduction. So cool. okay. all right, we'll, thanks, we'll come back. We'll come back to you, mm -hmm. Kelly. Great. Hi, Janet. I'm the department assistant, um, and I handle a lot of the uh, permitting that we do for the city, uh, complaints, uh, the board meeting minutes, and jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> nice to meet you. We love Kelly. She's the go-to. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Elliot? Hi there. Uh, it's, uh, oh, now you can see me. Hi. <laughs> um, Hi, my name is Elliot. Um, I'm the newest public health nurse uh, with the DHHS. I started uh, about a month and a half ago. Thank you. Anybody else from the department here? That's nope. OK. All right. Um, thank you. Um, and um, Elliot, do you want to show us your dashboard? Sure. Am I able to uh, share screen? Currently? I think you're a co-host, Elliot. Okay, excellent. Let me just pull right, it. Let me double check. Um, yep, you're a co-host. Okay. 
So here is our dashboard this time around. Um, so as per usual, the case rates are kind of staying in the same place. The test positivity is kind of staying in the same place. Um, it seems like this is likely um, at least in part because of super low test uh, uptake in terms of um, the tests that we get the data from rather than rapid at-home tests. Most people are using those at-home tests. And although some people are you know, directly reporting their positives to us, most people are not. Um, I saw, I recently saw a graph of, of, you know, a national poll showing how many people are using rapid tests versus, um, versus the, the lab tests. And it's, um, it's been a quite a drop. Um, but we can see the hospitalization rate is still going up. It's been going up for the last two weeks um, pretty consistently. Um, the percentage of beds occupied by COVID patients has also been climbing. Um, this has now put us in the medium level risk as a county, um, which is also true of now of all of Connecticut and Rhode Island as well. And we're still in the high level of community transmission, which we have been in for some time. Um, so I think it's kind of a wait and see. We're not seeing, we're not yet seeing a peak that is like definitive. Um, I mean, I think we are seeing like a slow swell, but it's really hard to tell where it's going to go. It's not, it's not a peak like the Omicron waves where it was, I mean, it was exponential. This is kind of just, it's been going up and down a lot over the last few weeks. Um, wastewater data is kind of looking the same. We did have this, this is the county wastewater data, data by the way. Um, and we did have this big peak kind of in um, late September, um, came back down and we're kind of waiting to see if it's gonna come back up. Um, our city wastewater data, we only have a little bit of information so far. Um, we just started I think about three weeks ago with Northampton wastewater data. Um, and it seems to be following roughly along the same trajectory as the county. Um, although our spike has been a little bit more significant than there, as you can see that here it has even gone up a teeny bit. I have a question. Um, and maybe I don't know if you or Meredith know the answer. Are this the wastewater data per capita? I am just wondering, we had this big spike at the end of September. And no other county in Massachusetts had the spike or had it as big as we did. And I'm wondering if it's because we started adding data or is this just totally per capita and, and that might have nothing to do with it. So let me pull up the BioBot website because they're, um, let's see. Well, here's the CDC, but BioBot is where we get it from. Let me stop sharing for one second. I'll pull up the company that does it with us. I So they give us two numbers. They give us a, I believe, a, oh yeah, it is concentration. So it's, it's because it's concentration, it's, you know, if we're, if we're getting a larger volume of wastewater, that wouldn't necessarily affect it. Um, the other thing they give us is they give us sort of an adjusted, um, level that they have a proprietary algorithm, which um, sort of tries to account for how far different population centers are from the facility and how many households are putting in and what kinds of um, like wastewater systems they've got, stuff like that. Um, so I so don't, don't, yeah, I think because it's concentration, it wouldn't be affected by just simply more coming in, yeah. Okay, okay, great. So so I just wanna clarify, you're referring to, North, Joanne, your question was referring to Northampton wastewater collection. Well, yeah, because that data just started being collected a few weeks right. ago, and then we have this big bump a few weeks ago. That just seems right. a little coincidental. And is mm -hmm. the Northampton data collected by Biobot? Is it all yeah. put together? Oh. Um, so, so, um, first of all, that big spike actually had already peaked and had come down significantly when we started sampling. Okay. Um, so we kind of caught the down curve of it. Um, 
And um, BioBot as a company is not super transparent about where they're sampling or how they jam these numbers together to give us one number at the other end. Um, so they say that they use a combination of sites that the CDC tests and that become public data, plus sites that they themselves test. I looked at the CDC data and there aren't any in Hampshire County, so it's got to all just be BioBot. Um, and they are, yeah, they're, they're, they're the ones who are producing this county information here, as well as the people um, who are collecting in Northampton. So Elliot, just because I can't see it being distinguished, are you mapping Northampton against Hampshire County? Not okay. yet. Um, Not yet. Okay. We have so little data. Um, okay, but you will be doing that for us. For you. I believe that's the plan. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, and Meredith, did you want me to give a little bit of an update on vaccination in terms of you know what we've done for flu and for COVID? Sure, go for it. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, so we're we're fully in the swing of flu clinic season, um, both in the city and regionally. Um, just today, we had our big senior center flu clinic um, vaccinated. Uh, I believe almost two hundred people so far. Let's see. Oh, I had it open and it might have kicked me out. Um, so, well, so, so far this in just in the last month, we've vaccinated over 500 people for the flu and over a thousand people um, with the new bivalent COVID booster. So we're, we're keeping it. And, and we're closing our facility at the Elks. We're no longer going to be serving um, the population there. That is the plan. I, I will say that we have definitely over the last week, it's started to drop off. We're, we're seeing a lot more cancellations, a lot more no-shows at our, at our booster clinics. The demand now, a lot of people are asking about the booster for your children now because it's just been approved down to age five. So we're in, we're in discussions on how we can kind of best serve the community in, in that age demographic. Uh, so just the question then, um, maybe to Meredith, um, so we're planning on um, something to be to be delivered directly to the community that's going to take the place of, I mean, the, the Elks has got a lot of good press and, <laughs> um, you know, people like going there. So where would they go now? So we're not going to have a regular scheduled clinic um, any longer. What we're really going to do is identify the populations that um, are under vaccinated. And we're really going to hone in on that and target those populations. And we're going to see where the need is. Before we made the determination to close down the clinic, we really did our homework to see where vaccines are being given. We called the pediatricians, we called medical practices. It's, it's widely available now. We've never, you know, when we started vaccinating in January of 2021, we did it out of an emergency, you know, on an emergency basis. We really needed to support our community. We really, you know, we were well poised to mobilize and get the vaccine out there as soon as we got the vaccine in our hands. You know, we're coming on two years. We never imagined that we'd still be vaccinating at this point. We, as DHHS, are not in the business of just, you know, um, uh, of, of vaccinations um, being our primary job. And it really does eat up a lot of our resources. Done really good. Um, I, you know, we don't have a number on how many we've given to date, but, you know, any time we've had to roll with a lot of punches, we have um, made available to our community the vaccines as soon as they come out with a new a new vaccine. Um, we could probably be doing this forever if we you know if we allowed it. I imagine this is just going to be the way it is moving forward, just like the flu vaccine, that it will be at least an annual thing. Um, so at this point, you know, with the drop off with um, where we're at and learning, you know, what's the next phase of living with COVID, we feel that it's time just to stop having the regular clinic. 
that doesn't mean that we won't be a resource for those who are looking for vaccines. That doesn't mean if we were need to, needed to mobilize again, um, we would be there and able to do that. It's just the regular clinics we have to stop. Um, Elliot and I and Amy Hutchins, Director of Environmental Health, will be extremely creative on how we continue to vaccinate certain populations. Those are for future discussions. Mm -hmm. And we're still we're still making inroads with communities that are very vulnerable that we we hadn't even been able to reach at different points, like some of the different low income housing. So um, I think it's going to be exciting to focus our efforts on the people who kind of may not have access elsewhere. We're right. also going to continue with our regional work and bring the clinics, the mobile clinics to some of the smaller hill towns where you know they do have lower vaccination rates. So we'll continue with efforts just in a different way. Thank you. Joanne, you're on mute. I did hear that some of the pharmacies are having staffing issues that people sign up for vaccines and then can't get them because there's no no one to vaccinate them. Um, and you know that <clears throat> uh, one of the pharmacies closed in East Hampton. Um, so I, I'm I'm fearing that vaccines are not as readily available as they as they were. That's very true. Um, a lot of the you know. The pharmacies got into the business of um, vaccinating a couple years ago, and um, so honestly, they were they took away from what we did in terms of flu vaccines. Um, and then this year, I mean, just I want to say in the last three or four weeks, we've been hearing from a lot of places where CVS and Walgreens have been doing their mobile clinics, their mobile vaccine clinics. And just recently, they've had to um, either reschedule them in a future date because of staffing issues or, you know, just cancel them all together. So we're trying to pick up a little of the pieces where, you know, it's been dropped off, which has been also challenging because we're super busy with the, you know, the, the youngsters and doing our flu clinic. So, yeah, we've been hearing that from a lot of, you know, they they'll go into long-term health care facilities sniffs and they'll do the the clinics right there on site and now they're just kind of left at what do we do now so we're trying to support them the best that we can but yeah definitely they're definitely hurting i think Thanks. it's short term what's that i think it's short term though mm -hmm. Thank you, Elliot, and welcome. <laughs> Any questions for Elliot? Okay, great, thank you. Um, Meredith, do you wanna do a more formal introduction to John or? Certainly, uh, so I know Joanne and Cynthia, you are very well aware of this, but in May of 2022, um, the mayor by administrative order restructured the health department to the Department of Health and Human Services. And when doing so, um, she also put the Department of Community Cares underneath our umbrella. Um, at that time, Sean Donovan was hired um, the previous December as the implementation director of the Department of Community Cares. So he came to our team the end of May, early of June, and has been working with the DHH since, which we are pleased. Um, so I'd like to formally introduce you to Sean Donovan and ask him to speak briefly just about um, perhaps maybe what the transition has been like and the good work that you've been doing and where we're going in the future. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Meredith, and thanks for having me tonight. Um, I have some slides, but maybe that's not um, as useful. I'll just, I, I can just speak to <laughs> given our time. Um, yeah, uh, so as, as Meredith said, um, I started working more closely with, with Meredith and um, health commissioner now and our deputy commissioner, Michelle Ferry. Um, I think we started talking back in April and maybe before that even, uh, but more formalized into uh, May and June and July. 
And yeah, so a lot of this past um, now getting onto a year has been a lot of uh, fortifying relationships locally, uh, making connections broadly, like across the nation uh, with people who have already um, started community responder teams that we're looking to um, model after or, or just look at where we have some parallels. Um, and so one thing I did want to acknowledge in addition to other things, we were, um, Michelle Ferry and I were lucky enough to go to Portland, Oregon back in June, early June, which was really essential for how we were able to um, real time understand how uh, a city is, is using central dispatch and its public safety teams to uh, embrace a new uh, community responder team called Portland Street Response. Um, and so through that crash course of sitting in and dispatch, getting to be embedded on one of their responder teams, talking to their program evaluators and community health workers, it really helped us to clarify the contracts that we needed uh, for DHHS to um, you know, be well supported this next fiscal year to really uh, have community engagement, like understand how we need to uh, understand the data coming from our central dispatch to know like where our services fit in, um, both in terms of the time of the week, the time of the day, and you know what sorts of calls of service we're going to respond to as a team. Um, so that, that trip was really uh, important for us and we are, we're maintaining a relationship with Portland Street Response. Um, but yeah, now, nowadays uh, in, in October, we are well into uh, working with some of our, our our consultant partners, uh, Law Enforcement Action Partnership is one of them. Uh, they're a group that actually helped uh, Amherst establish you know, where they are today by working with them last fall um, to develop a, a report for their Crest team. So we're really grateful that they already have some knowledge of the area and how we could you know, collaborate with Amherst too through this interaction. They're gonna help us with a, a working group to have more of our leadership in the city and organizations and nonprofit leaders to help us determine how this best gets integrated into the city. Uh, because our ultimate goal, as I know some of you know very intimately, um, is to have a dispatched uh, first responder team that is not uh, fire, police, or rescue, but can really take on some of the calls that might be more fit to a team that does harm reduction responses or really well versed in responding to emotional distress and hearing voices and suicidal thoughts. Um, and can connect people with more basic needs and, and just establish relationships over time with people that are particularly, um, you know, finding themselves in hard places when it comes to being unsheltered, um, not finding connections with our other service providers for whatever reason. Um, we can provide, you know, a team, even though we will start small, I'm sure, um, that can fill in some of the holes where our crisis response, where our public safety is maybe, maybe struggling to fill, though they're doing honorable jobs with that. So, so yeah, we are looking to hire our first responders in the next several months, um, probably before that, I should say. And we have some amazing uh, partners that are local, but also nationally known, who are gonna help us with training and onboarding too. Um, and so we're developing a schedule for that. Um, yeah, there's, uh, I have to admit, my head is all in this. <laughs> So I'm not sure if I'm giving you enough of the context and, and the detail. Um, I wanna be mindful of your time and, and Meredith, if you, if you had anything to add or if you wanted to prompt me to share anything, that would be I, great too. I think one, one thing that's really important to add here is our goal is not just to check a box off and saying that the amount of police calls has changed our goal is to change outcomes. We, you know, it's just this cycle that goes on and on. We want to make sure that there are resources in place for people to get the help that they need once we respond to them, not just thrown back into the system. And so on a parallel track, Sean is working really closely with community action and building of the resilience hub. So I think that's really important to say that changing outcomes is what we're really, really keeping our, you know, our, our focus on. Because um, it would be very easy just to kind of say, oh, we've taken 10 calls this week where the police didn't have to go out. So 
Sean, if you want to add on to that, I mean, what GLAD and you, um, the community outreach that you're doing, mm -hmm. um, what the, you know, the pilot hub already has and is incorporating for services, that'd be great. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks for prompting that. And yeah, so I've been working, uh, as has Michelle and Meredith too, very closely with community action who are overseeing um, you know, holding the vision for the Resilience Hub, Community Resilience Hub, uh, both the programmatic pieces, but just, you know, what what is it that we can start to convene even without a physical space? Um, that being said, there is, I think some of you probably know this already, but uh, at St. John's Church on Elm Street, uh, Mana Community Kitchen is, is hosting um, a drop-in space, which they have been doing for a couple of years now. And that is act, acting as the temporary resilience hub right now. So there are, um, you know, services like uh, medical and harm reduction and housing supports that come through that space, Tapestry Health, um, but not they're not like um, they're not housed there, but they come through at certain times during the week, so that people who are in need of supports like that, who are maybe are seeking out the space for the needs of showering or companionship, or you know, trying to work with someone to get um, benefits or housing, like they have other supports that are, are wrapping around them too. And our vision is to further develop this into um, a more permanent uh, drop-in space that would also have, you know, food like MANA has, has done for so many years and amazing to share food together with people, but also supports and services that will come to, come to people where they're at. And so there's already something happening um, at MANA, which is amazing. So I make myself present there pretty often. Um, the other thing that I wanted to share that you you touched on, Meredith, is that you know I'm getting the sense from a lot of our um, public safety leaders, and I've known this as an advocate in the community for more than a decade, that um, sometimes when people have distress um, that renders them um, not being able to stay where they're at, whatever that looks like, sometimes people get taken to the emergency department and that's not always the best fit for people. Um, so I, we do want to continue working with Cooley Dickinson to figure out like, are there some creative ways we can um, be part of like ED diversion or ER diversion? And so we're still working out like what that could look like. But something on my mind is that, um, and like you said, Meredith, like we're, we're looking for different outcomes. I think we're also looking at prevention too. Like, are there ways that, you know, we can support people in conflicts or distress or clashes with not getting their basic needs met um, in different spaces. And so the Resilience Hub and the DCC are working together, you know, pretty closely to imagine, you know, how can the Division of Community Care like envision different supports and even the community safety in these elements. Um, and we're exploring like, is there other ways we can support having maybe a DCC specific space, which is still, you know, stuff we're figuring out how to fund, uh, but knowing that there are a lot of people that um, maybe get wrapped up in, um, you know, this this cycle of, of getting in and out of hospital when it's not really serving what they need. Um, if we had other support spaces, could that um, could we break some of those cycles? Could we figure out what people are are really yearning for or what they're missing? And so um, that's on my mind. The second piece that I've been working on with community action are some community events um, and also community trainings. Uh, just knowing that I'm so excited that our city is invested in institutional changes to create a new uh, team, like a community care response team. And I, I'm excited about the ways DHHS and our city can support um, people in our community, community leaders, drop-in center workers, um, interested community members uh, to learn new skills and strategies to support one another. And so I hope that we can continue to develop that. We did our first pilot workshop of different people coming in for um, a learning opportunity with Wildflower Alliance back in July. And we hosted a training called Beyond De-Escalation, uh, Moving Towards Connection and Co-Regulation. And it was just a three to four hour workshop. Uh, we had a bunch of our community partners, actually some of my coworkers, uh, health inspectors, uh, folks from Northampton Recovery Center, people from MANA, uh, community center, community action, Forbes Library, just a few people from each group coming in to have this conversation of how do we respond differently when there's um, distress present, when someone's angry, when someone's really emotional. Um, and so we, we worked together to figure out some other ways with the curriculum that Wildflower provided. And I hope we can offer more of those in the future and just give our 
city not only um, you know like other resources to call upon, but like more skills and strategies for people themselves, you know, to utilize when they need to. So that's another element of our collaboration, which feels important to me. Yeah. So yeah, see some hands. Thank you. You have a lot on your plate. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cynthia, just a reminder for the public, this is the board meeting and only board members are allowed to uh, speak at this time or invited guests like Sean. Um, Cynthia, did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, Sean, you, you were a frequent flyer during those seven, eight months that we were working on the police commission. And um, it is so amazing to see you in this role and I'm sure your head must be spinning. So thank you. Thank you for taking on the challenge. And um, just wanted to ask you, and, and this may not be the, the right, I, I can't, I, I struggle with my health role and my police former police commission role, but, but this work is so tied to health. So I'm so happy that the city has made that connection. But I'm just wondering if you could comment on all the, um, um, connections that you've been making, how the police department is responding to some of, to some of this initial planning work that you're doing right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm grateful that we're gonna be meeting with our police chief and our other public safety leadership on Monday. Um, we've had a convening, uh, what we call the convening uh, between some of our city leadership and um, some of our consultants that are really helping us with the, you know, the implementation piece rather than the onboarding and training. and we were able to have that uh, connection back in late September. So I'm really grateful that people, including the police chief are, are in this with us. You know, they're figuring out, like, even though there's a lot of new things to consider and unknowns, um, we're, we're talking through this together. So, um, and I think there's, you know, different things that we, uh, you know, in the Venn diagram of how we intersect, like there are some calls that I know that come through dispatch that go to police that I think they're looking forward to having another entity respond to. And so, you know, I think there's there's a sense of collaboration right now. Um, but we're also, um, you know, entering a new territory where we start to consider, um, you know, what, is it, what does it look like to come through central dispatch um, and decide on like whose team is going to respond to this call. And so that's, that's a lot of the work ahead. Um, we have a lot of great consultants, not just our connection to Portland Street Response, but we have some consultants um, from uh, former CAHOOTS in Eugene, Oregon, uh, crisis assistance, assistance helping out on the streets, um, former leadership who's helping us navigate this, a person involved with Denver Star uh, and Rachel Bromberg, who's from Toronto, but did a lot of, uh, does a lot of work with um, community responder teams in that context. So we have, we have support um, and also LEAP is helping us with their expertise around public safety and sharing some, um, you know, connections through former police chiefs who, who have also embraced this model. So I feel like, you know, it's, it's tough work to figure out how this something new happens, right, in the city. Um, but I feel like we have a lot of support from outside the city and, and we're, we're figuring out together how this is going to look inside the city. That's great. And Mer yeah. Meredith, I don't know if you want to share anything too. I didn't want to over... No that, was, no, that was well said, Sean. Yeah. I mean, this is a collaboration. We don't want the departments, you know, the public safety departments to feel like we are taking something over or stepping yeah. on their toes. We want to be totally inclusive, totally transparent, and again, collaborative in nature. Um, this is new embarkment for all of us, and we want to make sure, obviously, public safety is first and foremost. Um, but yeah, we have great working relationships with these departments already. So I, this will just enhance that. I, I just wanted to make a final comment that the, the best time I had during the commission was spending a couple hours in dispatch. Those people are amazing. They are just amazing. And I think it's an, a secret in the city. They sit in the tower in the fire department and they just take every single call with such grace and poise. So um I'm glad you're working with them. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. Yeah, I did. I will just add, I was able to sit, uh, do sit alongs a couple of times with Central Dispatch, uh, but I hope to do that again this this fall and winter. Um, it was so, I mean, just 
interesting to see how how things happen in that center, command center almost, but but also to see how people gracefully navigate a lot of different calls one after another. Um, yeah, it really, it, it was, it's fascinating. And also it's, it's really essential to how our, our new team is going to function, making sure that our, our dispatch is supported and knows, you know, what, what our team can offer in terms of, um, you know, public safety and public health. And, and we don't want to pretend to know that we have the answers, Cynthia, because we certainly don't. So we are relying on our consultants. We are relying on lessons learned, learned from other communities. And we are relying on the input of, you know, dispatch and PD and FD. So. Well, thank you for your work. Thank you. And thanks. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> thanks so much. All right, uh, we're going to move on just to uh, go to old business, review uh, some of the um, things we have in place. Uh, we have two advisories uh, out there, although they're not easy to find on our website, unfortunately. Um, we have the mask advisory that we uh, put in place um, um, in May. Um, it is on the COVID page down near the bottom of the page um, and that is a recommendation that everyone wear um, a mask when indoors um, and um, I just like to review this at every at every meeting after we've looked at our data to see if this something is that we still recommend and I would still recommend it any other thoughts would, would this be an appropriate time to just um, give a thought on the masking at the senior center or is that considered new business or other or? Um, I guess that would be new business. Um, but I do think um, the fact that we have an advisory, mask advisory out there as what we consider best practice is something that they might want to utilize um or acknowledge um meredith um well let's not i guess we can't go there right now it's not on our agenda um let's talk about these the old business first how about that fair enough um mask advisory thoughts about that i'm, I'm personally not recommending any changes but i could be ill-informed <laughs> willing to listen to other I thoughts. I don't recommend any changes. I mean, it's not a mandate. It's just yeah. a, our, our advice on best practice. Um, I just can, I, I'm wondering if there's more we could do um, to just be proactive about making sure various, you know, organizations, institutions and, and residents in the community that, that it that it is easy to find um, on the website, but also ways that we can do more outreach around it so that so like the example given that the senior center would consider putting up signage, you know, just that they would be more proactive given that they have a vulnerable population there. Meredith, any thoughts? So, yeah, I, I do speak with the new senior center director often. She asks the advice of um, us in regards to if there's a member that's COVID positive about communications that go out. Um, we talk about her population being high risk. So we all always want to err on the side of caution when we're putting out advisories um, and notify everyone and not just trying to separate the population who might have been there. So um, she does see counsel for me a lot. Um, and, and I think at this point, honestly, we don't want to be in the business of, of you know, um, regulating certain businesses on, on masks. I think the best thing that we can do is just keep advising, keep the communication open. But if 
if the public or the senior center members really want something, a policy implemented at the senior center, they should be working with the director and communicating with the director and also perhaps the uh, the board, the Council on Aging um, Committee or board, I'm not sure what they're called. But I think from the Board of Health perspective, um, you know, we have the authority to make policy and which we did a lot of during COVID, which was warranted, but we're now in a place that, you know, I feel that businesses have to take ownership and make their own policies based off, you know, just the <laughs> recommendations from local boards of health or MDPH or the CDC. I think making policies at this point and, you know, sector specific could be really, really tricky. I think about your guidance, um, Meredith, and, you know, the, the, a choir practice, <laughs> you know, we know that that's singing mm -hmm. is, is vulnerability. So maybe we'll hear from the singers or they're the gym. We know when people lift weights, there's a lot of grunting, you know, and, and so there's always going to be those populations that want to and don't want to. And I think the strategy of having the individual business organization building, listen to its members or occupants is a good one. Um, that's why I personally feel that the current mass advisory policy is is a good one as well. So um, uh, it's it's yeah. So I I don't know um, what more we can do um, other than people seek your advice all the time, and I'm sure you're you're giving them sort of um, pieces of what I just said. So, so maybe it would be worthwhile. Uh, Meredith, when you speak to the director of the senior center to remind her if she doesn't know already about our mask advisory. Um, and I don't know if there's any other way to put it out there. That's always been an issue for us is like, how do we put it out there? When do we put it out there? Um, I mean, it's not, it's not new business, but it still holds true. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I don't know. And I think maybe just a gentle reminder, um, maybe an uh, and I don't know, uh, an article or an opinion piece we could put out there that, you know, um, people are gathering indoors again, we've got the holiday season, of, you know, we could put out some type of communication. Um, I do feel that we're going to see a little spike in COVID as people do go indoors. Um, so I, it, it couldn't hurt to do something more. But it, it's, you know, this is this is how it's going to be, I think, ongoing. It doesn't mean, you know, things couldn't change and we do set policy again. I'm not discounting that. I'm just saying for where we're at right now, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Are you proposing you put out a press release or write an article or who would do that? I can take that on. Uh, myself, Elliot, can take that on. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Elliot, I just volunteered you. <laughs> I see that they're still on the phone. <laughs> I can hear you. Um, <laughs> Elliot's only been here. Last summer is the flu season, so I feel like I can take things on again. <laughs> or flu vaccine season. Mm -hmm. right. flu. Yeah, we can we can do something and put it put it out there as a reminder that this is best practice when you're indoors amongst, you know, a crowd of people that are not in your own unit pod. And I uh, I'm actually gonna be starting weekly office hours at the senior center. Sorry, that's my dog. Um I'm actually gonna be starting weekly office hours at the senior center this week, actually tomorrow. So um I can also um, make myself available for anyone there, whether staff or uh, or people who are coming in, um, just if they have questions about masking. That's great. That's great to hear. Did we always provide that service at the senior center? Whoops, you kind of froze on us, Meredith. So maybe that was a yes. <laughs> can you hear me? Uh, now I can. Okay. 
Yeah, that you we used to have regular office hours there twice a week and we actually okay. had our own little space, um, cool. which was awesome, probably about four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's glad I'm glad to hear that we're getting back to that. Nice. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Um, great. You there when you're there. During that, those hours, what are what are the services that are provided to the senior centers? Um, so it's part of it is just people can drop in and ask questions. I'll also be doing um, blood pressures. I can do um, um, kind of basic vaccine and, and medical um, concerns. Um, we're looking into, um, there is a way that we can basically with medical oversight and approval offer a wider range of, of stuff like um, blood sugar checks um, and that kind of thing. So we're looking into expanding our offerings. Um, but at this point, you know, we're, we're keeping it to anything like very non-invasive. Um, but whatever, you know, I have the, the scope for and whatever we have the equipment for, I'm happy to provide there. Did you and whatever say the need and want is of the members, I think Elliot being there will give opportunity to actually um, ask what it is that they're looking for. Um, some types of survey on, you know, what the need is. And if there's a dedicated space, you could certainly have a sign there with what the mask advisory is. When they anybody who comes in to see you with any questions would then see that. I'm not for certain we have a dedicated space. Oh. Yeah, I think because it's been so long uh, since we had that partnership in that form, uh, we may not have that space anymore. But I'm excited to see what the need is and what the wants are, and you know, move forward. Thank you for doing that. Um, we also have an advisory out there on mask hours. Um, that was a request or a recommendation that uh, grocery stores and pharmacies, what we consider essential services, have an hour of the day where everyone wears masks. And I'm not sure that I can't even find it on our website. So actually, um, uh, Meredith, can you? Um, be sure that can you find that and maybe get it on our website and maybe these two advisories could have a section of their own that are you know board of health recommendations or something like that so it's not sort of mixed in with all our minutes and everything else yeah um that would be great um do we still want to keep that advisory yeah i i think it's encouraging i mean i only know of river valley and Broadside, well, River Valley has special hours, but I don't think the other supermarkets do. And I know Broadside still has a mask requirement. So just letting organizations feel part of this initiative mm -hmm. <laughs> is a good thing. Yeah. All right. Um, I will give you a little update on the ventilation task force. We have a small but mighty little group, um, and we're really proud of our work. So um, we continue to uh, do our little PowerPoint presentation uh, for various groups, although it's hard to find um, groups who are really ready to, to listen. We did, um, Josh and I did an in-person um, in presentation to the, a bunch of, of folks mm, I can't remember the name of the group, but it's representatives from all the other uh, departments of public health in Hampshire County. HPHPC. Yeah, that one. <laughs> um, so that went really well. Um, and then, um, as I mentioned last time, a Amy Kayleen and the DNA, DNA um, has uh, taken us under their wing and submitted uh, for us a proposal for uh, ARPA money. Um, so that was due um, a few days ago, uh, last Friday, I believe, and we had filled out all the forms and written it all out. Um, and so as far as I know, that was submitted. I'll have to check in with Amy to be sure about that. Um, 
And then we, our uh, ARPA money funds, um, we should hear back uh, at the end of December and uh, hopefully to be able to just disperse funds um, in early January. Um, and so uh, that's going really, really well. We have a new uh, member on our task force, um, Dave Reckhow, who is a professor of uh, water chemistry, has joined the task force. Um, and um, so we meet every couple of weeks and sort of slowly move forward. I think now that we've, um, we've submitted the ARPA grant uh, request, I think our next um, uh, work will be on deciding how to encourage businesses um, to upgrade their ventilation, uh, how to get the word out that ARPA money may be coming and how to encourage them to participate. Um, so that's probably the, the next next step. And then in January, when we get funds, there'll be a little scurry of a lot of uh, a lot of meetings to try to um, to give out the money appropriately. Uh, we have some pretty um, pretty clear criteria on what we're looking for and and um, uh, businesses um, basically they can have HEPA filters or they can get filters for their central air system. They can get a technician to come out and visit. And we actually put in the proposal a few uh, CO2 monitors that the Department of Health would buy and uh, businesses can borrow, um, borrow or rent um, to check their spaces if they have questions about how their, their ventilation is. Um, so um, we're excited about that. Anybody have any questions? Joanne, that's just amazing work. And I think you and others <coughs> have sent out this article by Zeke Emanuel about all the things that we're not doing or did wrong in COVID. And one of them was, whatever happened to ventilation? Because right. that that's a game changer and can be a game changer. And we just, you know, it's just been very distracting during COVID. So thanks for keeping that alive. I think it's really- Yeah, yeah I was uh, went to a lecture today remotely um, about different interventions and how they're perceived. And the person giving the talk put in ventilation as sort of, uh, well, you know, high for, for uh, receptivity from the community on it. And um, also, uh, high for individuals since so they sort of did community interventions versus individual interventions. Um, and so it's great for individuals because most individuals don't have to deal with it. It's right. A business puts it in place and individuals don't have to, you know, won't mask or, or whatever it is, don't have to deal with it. Um, but I have to say that, you know, for some businesses, the expense can be pretty high um, if they have central air or if they need to modify things. Um, and so, uh, you know, for a whole building, for example, to redo their ventilation could be massive. And I know that we're going to hear more and more about um, uh, ventilation and probably, you know, maybe even a few years down the road, the feds will put in new regulations about, you know, what, what building codes, what buildings have to um, do to be up to code. Um, but for restaurants and bars, for example, in our city, it's relatively easy by putting in portable HEPA filters. So hopefully um, we will encourage them uh, to do that and they will have a safer city. So, all right. Um, all right, any other comments um, before we go to minutes? I just want to say I also read the article and, you know, this is not an area I'm very familiar with in terms of ventilation systems and um, certainly the impact for COVID as well as a lot of other diseases and maybe I don't know what the proposal, it sounds like the ARPA proposal is asking for money but not for specifically for specific institutions, like I'm just not familiar with are the schools ventilated well and things like that um, currently. So I don't know if there might be, I don't want to take time now, but if there'd be an opportunity to talk to you, Joanne, or or who you would recommend to kind of just get up to date on mm -hmm. ventilation in general mm -hmm. and what's going on with that. I'd really appreciate that. Yeah, I'm happy to, to talk to you offline about it. Basically our proposal was to take the highest risk situation uh, 
locations, which are bars and restaurants where people can't mask, even if they wanted to, you can't mask while you're eating and drinking, um, and and encouraging um, those institutions to assess their current ventilation and decide what, you know, we have a whole sort of educational flow sheet. If you have this kind of ventilation, here's what you can do. If you have that, you, here's what you can do. And then to submit a request um, for, I need three HEPA filters at $150 each and, you know, a replacement filter for each one of them. And that's going to cost this much money, um, you know, based on the size of their room uh, or their rooms. Um, and, uh, or if they have a uh, central air, whether they can upgrade their filters, they need a ventilation technician to come look at their system, we could support that, those kinds of things. I mean, we're really focused on those two interventions. There's a lot of other interventions that are out there that aren't really, um, and people are constantly telling me, hey, have you heard of this one? Have you heard of this one? And we want to use this one. And, and I was like, that's just sort of not what the CDC and um, the FDA have recommended. I mean, it's really, we're starting sort of just giving some very basics. Mm -hmm. You can either filter your air um, or you can increase the amount of fresh air in addition to filtering the air that comes in. Um, so, um, you know, there's lots of other systems with uh, peroxide or with, I don't know, radiation or with, um, what's the other thing, ozone. So mm -hmm. we're, not, we're not going with any of those fancy things. It's not really proven. Some of them may be bad for health for people with asthma. And so we're sticking with the real basics of things that are in a, relatively inexpensive and that we know work. Um, it's not that, oh, some of those other things won't work, but we don't need to go there. So, but we have a slide set and a, um, we, did a presentation on Zoom, so with the slides, so I can um, get ask uh, Amy to send that to you. I don't know if it's That's posted great. yet, but it should be posted soon. But we can uh, get that to you. Joanne, just kind of thinking about this and in regards to sustainability, is there any conversations that are being had around policy change, maybe for new buildings or new structures, like, uh, you know, in the building code, making sure that, you know, certain there, you know, a certain amount of circulation um, within a certain time period to make sure that we're meeting the mark. So moving forward, I mean, we know the importance of ventilation and I know it would be hard to retrofit, hard and expensive, right? To retrofit going backwards, but I'm just thinking, as we move forward, is there any advocacy work that we could do around policy change? Is that being discussed at all? Uh, we haven't discussed that, but um, one of the questions on the ARPA application was, you know, once these funds run out, what are you going to do or what, right. what are you going to do moving forward? And I think that would definitely be something if we even didn't, if we didn't have money, we could still do advocacy around that. I wasn't sure if building codes are state run or feds or do you know where they come from? They are state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we would have to lobby at the state level. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see what the air exchange requirements are. I, I, I know they vary by the type of business, but looking at what they are and where we'd like them to be, um, I think starting to look at that and then advocating. Yeah, I think, you know, once we get through this granting process and all mm -hmm. that, we can, mm -hmm. can go there. I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. uh, if I can speak to whether the, um, though that information is posted, it is currently posted on the website. Um, it's in the Division of Inspectional Services Resources. Great. Thank you, Elliot. Great. Um, anything else before we move to our minutes? Yes, one big staffing update. Um, Kate Kelly has resigned from her position. I just wanted to let you know. Um, her last day is, I believe, the 28th of this month. Very sad to see her go. She is our vaccine clinic warrior. She has sacrificed a lot over the last two years. To, to make this happen. Um, she is an amazing person, nurse, employee. She's gonna be missed dearly. 
Yes, very sad to see her go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll send her a note. Um, and Meredith, are you um, looking to hire another nurse? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so please spread the word. Yeah, I don't know if, you know, if you have networks that you can circulate the job posting, that would be mm -hmm. fabulous. Where is the job posting that we can get it from? So it was on the city human resource website. We've put it on our social media, our Facebook page. Um, I believe it's on our webpage. Elliot could probably speak to that better. Um, and then we've gotten it out to our associations like MHB, MHOA. Um, yeah, I've asked Elliot to look into connecting with the universities that have nursing programs and getting it circulated there. We have not had good luck in um, getting applicants in for this position. Is it a full-time position? It is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With wonderful benefits and a great team to work with. <laughs> if you say so yourself. <laughs> Would you regard the salary as competitive in this crazy world of um, medical personnel? In Western Massachusetts, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Great. Let's um, go to the minutes. Uh, did anybody have uh, comments about the minutes? I do have comments from. Um, from Suzanne. Okay. Uh, I wanted to take her place. Um, are, we, are we missing a comma somewhere? Yeah. Well, Kelly, <laughs> did did she happen to mention my status as being both present and absent? <laughs> did she? Uh, no, she didn't. She Whoa. missed it. <laughs> wow. I wish she was here. Well, I'm both present and absent, and actually, I questioned myself and looked at the calendar to see what I was. And I, and I think I was there. So. Okay, great. Okay, well, I can take that off. Thank you. <laughs> um, so under new business, the third bullet, um, she thought it should be public health emergency of international concern with concern capitalized. And then there was the Department of Health and Human Services. She wasn't sure if we were talking about Northampton or um, federal. So we should distinguish mm -hmm. which department was doing the monitoring around the Commonwealth. I don't know what was meant by that, anybody? In the context of the monitoring arm, well, I don't know now. Hmm. I would think it's the Northampton Department of Health and Sur Human Services monitoring what's happening in the rest of the state, as yeah. well as locally. I would think so, yeah. <clears throat> okay. And then the fifth bullet under the wastewater testing um, was received approval. Uh, approval for what? Which I think the way it is written, um, it was it was actually the approval for the the wastewater testing that uh, mm -hmm. the commissioner had asked the Mass DPH for. So maybe it's just a matter of rewording. I think instead of saying who will fund, it's say to to fund to fund. Mm -hmm. Has asked received approval from Mass DPH to fund wastewater testing through June 2023. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Anything else? Nope, that was it. Cynthia, do you have any comment other comments besides being present? No, thank you. <laughs> but I, I could move to approve the minutes from July 28th, 2022. Well, so here's a question, Janet. Ah, sorry. I am assuming that Janet would recuse herself because she wasn't at the meeting. And then there's only two of us. Right. So do we need to wait to approve the minutes until we have a quorum? Yes. Provided Suzanne doesn't go through them again. <laughs> <laughs> so we will defer these until the next meeting. How about that? 
Um, and then the last item is always um, when we're going to meet again. And the next meeting um, scheduled November 17th as the normal meeting. So we're there generally the third Thursday of every month. Is that still good for everybody? Yes. Yes. Right, Meredith? Yes. Great. Thank you. We will meet on November 17th. Any last items? No, if I hear back from Cheryl Sparrow, I'll just forward you that information beforehand so you have it. Great. Thank you. So we'll put um, the follow up for the uh, hearing on the next agenda. Um, okay, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Welcome, Janet. Thank you. you. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you guys. Oh, move. Move what? to. Oh, yes. Go oh. vote for it. I uh, move to adjourn the meeting. I right here. Great. Any discussion? All in favor? Cynthia? Yes. Janet? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you. And Thank welcome you. back, Meredith. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.